Dr. Kim Schreiner is a nationally renowned infectious disease specialist um, here in Pasadena. And she's often referred to as the Dr. Fauci of the San Gabriel Valley. She's affiliated with Huntington Hospital where she teaches also as a faculty member. And beyond her invaluable leadership during this COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Schreiner is the founder and director of Huntington's Phil Simon Clinic which provides complete HIV and infectious disease care for the underserved in San Gabriel Valley. In 2001, she also founded the Phil Simon Clinic Tanzania Project. It's a nonprofit global outreach program in East Africa. And I was fortunate enough to join Dr. Schreiner and our, her group or our group um, uh, on two um, of these trips where um, nurses, doctors, social workers, and um, those interested go to help the underserved in, in Tanzania. But whether she's in America or Africa, she's an amazing resource for our community. And despite her incredibly busy schedule, she made time for us tonight. So Dr. Schreiner, thank you. Well, thank you, Janice. Um, it's an honor. And I will tell you that Janice is a is just a fantastic person to have not only on our board, but also uh, to work with us in Africa and in, in a very good sport about working under sometimes very difficult conditions. And one of these days, Dr. Fauci is gonna come into the San Gabriel Valley and <laughs> find out who this imposter is. <laughs> so so I, if I disappear suddenly, you might wanna suspect that Dr. Fauci could be behind it. I was actually listening to him on NPR when I was driving home from the office a few minutes ago and he was, he was being interviewed by Mary Louise Parker with Dr. Francis Collins and they were reminiscing about one year ago and what they were doing and what was beginning to happen and so forth. And I think all of us can look back with some reflection now, uh, having been doing this for a year and understand what an important historic but really terrible uh, thing we've had to go through and are continuing to go through. Uh, I do think there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm going to talk about that tonight. Uh, but we do have to try to persevere for a few more months. We've invested so much uh, personally and from uh, in science and in our economy and our country and globally to try to get to the other side of this thing. And so it's very important that we continue to be very, very careful in what we uh, do in terms of our changing our behaviors and opening up society. So. Um, uh, so we have far to go, but we are getting there slowly if, uh, and steadily. Uh, so tonight I'm going to talk predominantly about the vaccines and a little bit about um, therapies. And uh, as uh, uh, Rachel said, I'm going to be, I'm happy to answer questions at the end of which I'm sure you might have some about that. So this is the number, this actually was yesterday, I didn't change the date here because every day it goes up, 525,750 Americans have lost their lives to this disease. They were alive one year ago today. Uh, they are no longer with us. Uh, 2.7 million people globally have died from COVID. And we, we think that this is a, probably a pretty gross underestimate of the number of people that have, have died from this disease. So this is one of the most historic pandemics. Uh, in 100 or 200 years, they'll look back and say that was the pandemic of 2020. Uh, and um, the numbers are, per, are pretty horrific. They're continuing to go up. Uh, and uh, by the time we get over the final hump with this virus, it may well be uh, even close to 750,000 people. So uh, in the United States alone, not to mention what's happening globally. So um, it really is a horrendous uh, event. I think it is important to remember that that's not just a number, that those are people. Those are fathers and mothers and sons and daughters and sisters and brothers and spouses and friends. And so uh, their legacy, I hope, is that during this time we have learned something about ourselves and something about this virus and the importance of science and truth uh, and that we can pull together not only as a country but as a planet and try to do better the next time we have a pandemic. So I hope that's what our legacy will be with this. As you probably all know, we just recently got through a horrendous surge of disease um, I've been an, an infectious disease doctor for almost 30 years, and I have to say, I've, I've, I'm an HIV specialist, as Dr. Devolio said, um, but um, so I'm used to some pandemics, but this was the, like something I'd never seen before. 
December and January were really the most horrific uh, months uh, that our hospital has experienced and certainly probably in many respects our country. Um, tremendous amount of disease. And I will talk a little bit about why I think that surge was so significant. Uh, but viral surges are common with viruses. And we could see that back in the 1918 pandemic uh, with influenza. And you can see that the big surge sort of, there was some couple of little surges here in the summer in 1918. And then the big surge happened uh, kind of in October and November. And then they did have another little bit of a blip out here uh, in the early spring. I think that that's going to be a pattern that we may well follow. As you can see, this is sort of what's happened with us. Uh, and why is that? Well, there's a couple of factors going on here. The first is that viruses are seasonal. And these two viruses, influenza and coronavirus, uh, do have seasons to them. Some of that has to do with temperature. A lot of that has to do with movements of populations moving indoors when it's colder. Uh, and some of it has to do with the virus itself in terms of its infectiousness and, uh, and so forth. So uh, our, our situation has uh, looked very similar. Uh, and so I think reasonable to expect that we may have uh, another surge uh, down the road. We certainly are going to have some more uh, bumps in the road, uh, but hopefully nothing like we just got out of. What's worrisome is that we've sort of plateaued here. We've had a very steep decline uh, since January, but we've kind of plateaued at this spot here. And that's why when you hear Dr. Walensky, uh, the head of the CDC, or Dr. Fauci talk about what they're still concerned about, there's a very high density of disease out there. Uh, also, we, are, we know, which is what coronaviruses do, is that they mutate. And so we probably have some more virulent virus uh, variants now circulating uh, in our country and throughout the world. And those are something we have to keep an eye on as we move forward. Now, one of the big differences between now and in 1918 was that they didn't have a vaccine. Uh, or any vaccine, or you know, we have multiple vaccines now, and that's an incredible achievement to do that in one year. Uh, 13 months ago, none of us had ever heard of SARS-CoV-2, uh, and in that time period, we have identified the pathogen. We've understood a little bit about its tremendous pathophysiology, its ability to harm the host. We've learned about its transmission, and finally, we've actually been, been able to develop some a little bit of some therapies, and also, most importantly, a vaccine. So. That's an important achievement in the background of this very, very serious illness. Uh, we know it's a highly infectious pathogen. It is a beta coronavirus. It came from a spillover event, a zoonotic spillover event, probably from bats, uh, which is often the cause of pandemics. Uh, and we know it's very infectious. It's transmitted by infected droplets. We also know that it can be aerosolized and so that tiny micro droplets can transmit the disease. And that's an important realization we le learned fairly early on in the pandemic. Uh, this is SARS-CoV-2 embedded in the uh, pili or the nasopharyngeal cells of someone's uh, nose. Uh, and that is the portal of entry for most of the time for the virus. And so it's very, very infectious. We know it's a very aggressive virus. This is a marvelous animation from the uh, New York Times. These are the spike proteins that are expressed on the outside of coronavirus, hence the name coronavirus, uh, which is actually named by a, a female micro microscopist in the 1970s. Uh, they have all these little spikes on their surface and that makes them sort of look like the sun. And we know that those spikes are the attachment site for the virus. We know that this virus affects many parts of the body, not just the lungs, although that is the principal organ that's affected certainly first, but it can also affect the heart, the brain, the intestines, the liver, the kidneys, uh, certainly the immune system and the coagulation system. Uh, and uh, it is a devil once it gets into the body. This is, this is not influenza, it's a very, virulent virus. It's highly infectious uh, with very bad outcomes in many people. It's also very unpredictable. Yes, there are individuals who have comorbidities that put them at risk, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, pulmonary disease, but we also know it can kill 33-year-olds and 15-year-olds and people that are otherwise healthy. And so this is a very, very dangerous virus that um, has reaped its uh, terrible work through our country and continues to be a problem around the world. Uh, this is an amazing um, electron cryomicrograph from uh, Pamela Bjorkman's lab at Caltech. And these are small little uh, coronavirus particles you can see in the um, uh, respiratory epithelium of a patient with uh, COVID-19. We also know that like many infectious diseases, this uh, disease affects people disproportionately. It is It has really pulled the scab off of some pretty serious stuff that we have to examine in our own societies about equity of healthcare, uh, other kinds of social inequity, 
uh, identifying populations at risk and providing them with access to the same things that uh, affluent people have access to. Uh, but this is a common thing in infectious diseases. The poor are, are, are always disproportionately affected. They are often individuals that can't stay home. They can't sequester. They can't afford to be home without and not work. They're essential workers. They have to go to work to feed their family. They may live in multi-generational homes with lots of people in the house. Uh, and, uh, and they may not have access to good health care in their community. Uh, so this is something we have to pay attention to and try to address as we move forward in preventing this disease, especially as we uh, roll out the vaccines and identify populations that are at very high risk. We also know how we can control it. And the truth is we can control this virus very, very simply. Wear a mask. Masking has, is the simplest most effective way of controlling this virus, preventing you from getting infected, preventing you from infecting other people and getting the pandemic under control. Unfortunately, it, had, it has become a political statement. Uh, and that's unfortunate because it's just a mask. It's a piece of cloth you, that you protect your nasopharynx with. Uh, it's highly effective. We knew it was effective during the 1918 pandemic to prevent influenza. And there's no question that in counties and parts of the country where mask mandates are in place, there is much less disease than in places where masks uh, are not required or are actually discouraged because of, of politics. Uh, and we're going to see this, I'm sorry to say, in some states that are now pulling back mask mandates very quickly. Uh, the virus doesn't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. It doesn't care whether you're a northerner or a southerner or a blue state or a red state. It just wants to go to another host. And so this is uh, really a, a very challenging thing to try to encourage people not only to wear a mask now, but to keep doing it for the next few months as we begin to emerge from this cloud of coronavirus. We know that practicing social distancing is important, avoiding congregate groups, uh, and of course, washing your hands. Um, but we also now know that we have a way out and that is probably the vaccines and that's what I'm going to discuss uh, in just a little bit. There aren't very many good treatments for COVID-19. That's the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. Um, many of you have heard about remdesivir. That's the only approved antiviral we, we have right now. It was originally designed actually for Ebola, um, uh, but we, it was sort of a repurposed antiviral. It has some activity against the virus. Uh, I use it a lot in my patients uh, because it may help trim off one or two days in the hospital. It is not very effective in people who are very, very sick with COVID, although we still give it to them in the hopes that it might turn things around. Um, I will talk a little bit about some other antivirals. We know that COVID-19 really, or that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 really impacts the immune system. And so there's been one sort of pivotal study that was done by the British, the UK recovery trial that recognized that anti-inflammatory drugs, especially things, common ones like dex dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, prednisone, um, are very effective at tamping down the inflammation that happens with uh, uh, COVID-19. This drug, tocilizumab, uh, is a newer anti-inflammatory and it was uh, just introduced uh, into the recovery trial again, looking at some data and does in fact seem to be of some utility in people who have a lot of inflammation while they have severe COVID-19. But these are not game changers. These drugs work moderately well they may help save a life or two, they may de decrease the hospitalization duration, but they certainly don't actually prevent disease or, or turn people around quickly. So I mentioned dexamethasone and remdesivir. Uh, convalescent plasma, which you may have heard about, that's the plasma that's uh, donated by people who've had COVID. It's a, it's a mix of antibodies of some individual who survived COVID and, and donated their plasma. Uh, the problem is it's been very uh, mixed in terms of its response. Um, it may work well in people in early disease who haven't developed very many antibodies of their own. A lot of it is dependent on the amount of antibodies that are still in the plasma bag that's being infused, uh, but it's been kind of a disappointment. I'm actually uh, helping City of Hope do a study right now to kind of answer the question of, does the amount of plasma, uh, convalescent plasma antibodies that are in the bag make a difference? And so we're looking at that at, at Huntington. You probably have heard about monoclonal antibodies. Um, they are, um, uh, very interesting medications, very expensive medications. They got a lot of press when the president received Regeneron during his episode with COVID. Um, they also have been kind of a disappointment. Uh, they can be used very in very early disease. And in fact, there are some data now that suggest that they may be helpful for that in preventing people from coming into the hospital. You capture them very early. It's an intravenous infusion. As I mentioned, they're very expensive. 
uh, although they are provided under emergency use authorization. Um, uh, but they haven't been very well studied, and so they haven't been officially recommended by the NIH or the Infectious Disease Society of America. Anti-inflammatory medications, again, may be very helpful to suppress what we call the cytokine storm. These are chemicals that are uh, launched when the immune system gets activated, and that's really the pathophysiology, the end-stage organ disease problem that happens with COVID-19. It's a very inflammatory disease. When you look at uh, people that have not survived, if you look at uh, autopsy specimens, their lungs are like giant leather bags. They're just really inflamed, scarred down, very stiff. Uh, it's no wonder that these people have trouble breathing because it really uh, lot, uh, it sort of uh, causes a disorganization of the inflammatory system that's really very, very serious and quite unusual for viruses. Uh, this is um, just the convalescent plasma uh, theory where you have someone who's recovered from, uh, from COVID-19, they donate their plasma, they have these IgG antibodies. Uh, we went, then match that for a patient who just is coming in with acute COVID-19 uh, and we provide convalescent antibody infusions that help block the sites and decrease the amount of virus that's circulating around, but they aren't very effective uh, in the long haul. And so I think that, that we need to find better answers. Here's the monoclonal antibodies. I mentioned the bamlanivimib, which is the one that we've used at Huntington. I've used it a few times to sort of modest effect. Um, and there was a New England Journal study that showed it seemed to help a little bit. And uh, this is the uh, regan cov 2 trial. This is Regeneron. This is two different types of of monoclonal antibodies. Um, and that's the drug that, uh, that uh, President Trump received. Um, it also has some efficacy, but it, again, these are not game changers. So we really need to have some better therapies. And that may be happening. Um, many, many months ago, there was a little tiny article about a drug called EIDD2108. It was designed uh, to, it's an antiviral drug. It's directed towards uh, SARS-CoV-2, although it had, it had been studied for the first SARS outbreak and MERS, uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus. Um, it had actually originally been developed as a flu drug, but it didn't work for influenza. And what's good about EIDD2108, which has now been bought by Merck and called Mol Molnupiravir, is that it is an oral medication. It's given twice a day. And um, it seems to be a very effective in inhibiting the virus, not only in the culture uh, tubes where uh, drugs are first studied, but also in actual human tissue. It's now entering phase two and three trials. It's something to keep an eye on. It may be the Tamiflu uh, for coronavirus, just like we have Tamiflu for influenza. Um, Molnupiravir may be the drug that we use to treat people post-exposure, uh, pre-exposure, pre or as a, an oral treatment. So it's something to keep an eye on. And for those of you who may have watched 60 Minutes the other night, uh, this is a very interesting drug. During pandemics, lots of old medications are looked at and, and sort of tried to see if maybe we can find something, we might stumble on something that actually works. You saw that with hydroxychloroquine, that was a very big failure in spite of the fact that it just sort of was a drug that kept coming back and everybody wished it worked, but it didn't and it was actually dangerous. Uh, that has, that's happened with ivermectin, which is an anti-parasitic drug, does not work for COVID-19. Uh, um, there's not been any good trials that have shown it's effective. Uh, but this drug is a very interesting um, idea. It was thought up by a woman who actually had COVID, who's a physician, and she remembered that there were some studies in, in the situation of sepsis that drugs that we use for depression called serotonin uptake inhibitors, SSRIs, may have some activity in controlling the in, uh, immune system and, and sort of quieting things down when there's a hyperimmune response. And so she, she actually had COVID herself, and while she was sort of getting over the COVID symptoms, she looked into it and she proposed it uh, to a physician to, uh, to maybe do a trial. And so this trial was done um, with fluvoxamine, which is also known as Luvox, and it's an antidepressant. And this is a good trial. It was a double blind placebo controlled trial. They, gave, they had 181 patients. Half of them they gave placebo, half of them they gave the Luvox. These are all patients with COVID, by the way. Uh, the Luvox patients had no clinical deterioration. None of them were hospitalized and all of them recovered. Uh, the patients who received placebo, six of them deteriorated and required hospitalization. And if you watch the 60 Minutes episode, they talked about uh, some racetrack, uh, a racetrack physician who did it in his jockeys. And uh, they also said uh, that they had the same similar results. And in fact, unfortunately, one of their people died that had only received the placebo. So this is something to keep an eye on. This also is an oral medication. 
And it does act in a very scientific way on the immune system by tamping down the immune response. Uh, so it'll be maybe one more, one more thing we can put in our toolbox to try to deal with this. Now, when patient, patients get COVID, uh, their symptomatology doesn't just end when they leave the hospital. Many, many patients now are experiencing this chronic COVID syndrome uh, or long hauler syndrome. It tends to occur more commonly in individuals who've recovered after a serious illness, but it has been reported with people with mild to moderate illness as well. And it could be a whole host of things, the, the sort of famous brain fog where they have memory deficits, uh, ongoing pulmonary problems, shortness of breath, uh, intolerance to normal activities, uh, there may be um, uh, problems with depression. Uh, there may be issues with their immune system or their bowels. There's lots of things that can happen with post-COVID uh, or chronic uh, COVID syndromes. And so it's something to be starting to look at because these aren't, many of these individuals aren't able to return to work. Uh, and it's because they have physiologic problems that are a result, direct result of the virus or uh, related to the inflammation that comes from COVID-19. So we are in the process of beginning to put together a, a chronic a uh, long hauler clinic at Huntington, uh, and I'll keep you posted on that as that begins to develop. So let's get to the, the heart of the meat of the story here. Uh, one of the things that happened very, very early in the pandemic, the Chinese government was a little opaque about um, revealing what was happening in um, late November, early December uh, with the pandemic. And they, they should and rightfully deserve a lot of criticism for sort of not trying to get this thing under control and letting WHO come in and help. But what they did do is on January 10th, they put the genome for SARS-CoV-2, by that time identified as the, source, as the cause of the COVID pandemic, on the internet. They just put it on the internet. And uh, a Dr. Barney Graham, who's a very good friend of Dr. Fauci at the NIH the very next day, uh, noted that there was the genome and it was pretty much recognized very, very early that a vaccine was likely going to be our way out of this disease. And so he noted that and he began to um, develop uh, proteins that could be used for a vaccine. He handed those proteins over two days later to a little company called Moderna. And since that time, of course, the rest is history. They've developed a very effective vaccine. So let's backtrack for a second. Well, what is a vaccine? A vaccine is an injection or substance that when introduced into your body, it stimulates your immune system to create protective molecules, antibodies, or cells. And that prevents you from acquiring or getting sick from an infectious disease. Now, what do vaccines do? Well, they protect you from an infectious disease. Uh, they protect a community from the spread of an infectious disease. Uh, and they, you, they're occasionally used to treat infectious diseases. Ebola can be treated actually with a vaccine rather than with medications. To make a successful vaccine, they have to be safe. They should be well studied. They have to be directed towards the pathogen. In other words, very specific to the virus or bacteria that you're interested in. They should elicit a robust and lasting immunity in everybody. Uh, and that includes both the antibody part of the immune system and the cellular part of the immune system. They should be accepted by the public. You should be able to produce them in large quantities. They should have acceptable and not terribly difficult storage parameters, and they should have limited side effects. You can administer vaccines intramuscularly. All of us are familiar with that. That's currently how we administer this vac these vaccines. They can be given subcutaneously. You can give vaccines inhaled. Uh, there's an inhaled influenza vaccine. Of course, many vaccines are oral. Those of us old enough to remember the oral polio vaccine, typhoid vaccine is oral. Uh, and then there's some novel systems that are being developed for new types of vaccination that might be of interest with those of you who wanna pursue that. And what do you hope to see? Well, you wanna make sure that they're well tolerated, that there's minimal serious side effects, that there's less disease in the population that's vaccinated as opposed to those that aren't vaccinated, and that that uh, immunity is protective and diminishes the severity of the illness preventing death uh, and, and most, perhaps most importantly, preventing hospitalization. Very early on, there were uh, rhesus macaque studies that were done looking at the possibility of a vaccine. And it was very clear that you could develop a DNA vaccine. It's a little different than an mRNA vaccine that targeted the spike protein, the main part of the attachment of SARS-CoV-2 to the human cell uh, that rendered the animals not necessarily immune from getting infected, but certainly from getting sick. Now, one thing that came out of the study that was very important uh, that we actually are back, going back and looking at is that the animals that received the DNA vaccine as opposed to the ones that had placebo, when they directly inoculated those animals with SARS-CoV-2 into their noses, they were able to um, basically eliminate the carriage of the virus in their nose very quickly. So that may be a clue to the very important question of uh, can people who've been vaccinated still carry the virus? And we're beginning to think 
uh, that indeed the vaccines may help prevent that. And this would maybe give some support to that. So these are the many different types of vaccines that you can have. And these are the ones that are all directed towards the spike protein. All of these different types are being developed, but I'm gonna focus uh, predominantly on the nucleotide-based vaccines, uh, Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines, and the viral vector vaccines, that's the uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. These are the, the sort of five different types of vaccines. Um, Novavax, which is a very interesting a company, a new company is developing a, in the, they're in phase three trials uh, for a COVID vaccine uh, using a subunit that's similar to like a hepatitis B type vaccine. Uh, the RNA vaccines are Moderna and um, Pfizer, but also Novio has a DNA vaccine. And then uh, the uh, viral vector vaccines, this is a very traditional platform. This is what a lot of the other vaccines that we make like ad, uh, yellow fever and different kinds of common vaccines we use. Uh, and so AstraZeneca, the vaccine that's sort of had some trouble, uh, that's the one in, in England and also throughout Europe. And then of course, Johnson & Johnson is also an adenovirus uh, vaccine. Uh, so these are the ones that are being developed right now. Sinovac is an inactivated vaccine. It's made in China. Uh, there's also one called CanSino. Those are both being tested in countries uh, in Africa, in South America, Eastern Europe. And the old Sputnik V, which we all thought, hmm, that's not a well studied. You know, they had a phase three trial of a very limited number of people, uh, but it turns out it may well be very effective and safe. That's a traditional adenovirus platform and that's being utilized uh, not only just in Russia, but in some other countries around the world. So let's talk about what's available to us. So one of the really interesting things about this pandemic, and I think it's timely, is that much of the data and research done to develop these two vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, are thanks to the work of two women. The first is Catalin Carrico, uh, who I would keep an eye on. She may be winning the Nobel Prize fairly soon. She's the one who developed mRNA technology more than 20 years ago. So this isn't new technology, it's old technology, but we've just never been able to put out a vaccine to, to do it. Kazmekia Corbett works at the NIH with Dr. Fauci and she's been a principal investigator and developer of the Moderna vaccine. So it's nice to see uh, two women who really have made an impact uh, in, in this particular pandemic. And I think speaks to the strength of women in science and hopefully there's uh, some more young women following in their footsteps to help. Uh, but the mRNA technology has been around for about 20 years. It appears to be very safe. It doesn't harm the host. And it has been looked at for other vaccines, including the Zika vaccine, but the Zika pandemic kind of burned out before it could be uh, developed. So this is the Shriner simple cartoon of how does an mRNA vaccine work? Well, what you do, here's the SARS-CoV-2 virus right here. These are the spike proteins on the surface. Here's a, a human cell. And what happens is we don't wanna take this whole virus and inject you with live virus. That would give you COVID-19, not a good thing. So what the scientists have done is they've taken a little piece of the spike protein, and this is the recipe for the spike protein. This is the genetic, this isn't the actual one, but this suffice it to say for the purpose of this demonstration is the genetic recipe for the spike protein. What Dr. Carrico uh, uh, did is she developed this technology where you wrap it in this nice little protective oily molecule, and that's what goes in to your injection. And it goes into the human cell right there, up goes into the human cell and your body goes, well, wait a minute, what's that? I'm supposed to make, there's a, there's a direction. I'm supposed to make this thing called a spike protein. It doesn't go into your genetic material. There's no transfer of this material into your own genetic material. It just knows, tells the cell, I've got to make some spike protein. So it makes the spike protein that goes out into, the, into your body, but then your immune system, your, your T cells and B cells go, well, wait a minute, this isn't something I know, this is foreign. And so it starts making antibodies to this, okay? And antibodies are the first response for the immune system. The antibodies go up, they attach to the, the spike protein particles that are circulating and it kills the spike it, and it destroys the spike protein. So along comes the real virus with all the spike protein on the, on, the, on the outside. Now your body knows it's been trained to send out these antibodies to go and attack those spike protein molecules. They attach to the outside of the virus and it kills the virus. And that's how an mRNA vaccine works, crudely. So uh, what are the advantages? They're very safe. Um, there's no risk of cancer. They don't insert their genetic material into your genetic material. Uh, they're degraded by normal cellular processes, what's ever left over after the vaccine's injected. Uh, they can, you can fine tune and put in, dial in different recipes, which as you see, if we have a problem with variants down the road or mutant virus, that's gonna be a very important thing. They're very efficient at delivering the material into cells. 
um, there's not much um, response to the vector. In other words, the little vehicle that's carrying the information in, unlike adenovirus vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson, that may be a little more of an issue, although they're still very safe as well. And perhaps most importantly is they're really cheap to make and you can scale it up really fast. So you can make lots of vaccine very, very quickly. And that's what's happening with both Moderna and Pfizer right now. The disadvantages up until now, they've never been tested during a pandemic, but here we are. So this is the time to do it. There could be some unforeseen issues. There don't appear to be. The trials for both these vaccines were very large. Um, you know, as you begin to vaccinate 92, 100 million people, we're getting close to that mark today. Um, you know, there may be some little hiccups here and there that you see, but you, that you didn't notice before. But for mo the most part, they're very, very, very safe. Um, uh, you know, their immunogenicity and their duration of immunogenicity, in other words, how long they last is not well tested. We'll hopefully get that information as we move forward. Uh, and there have been a couple of failures with mRNA vaccines, HIV, which is a hard virus to make a vaccine, Ebola, similar story. The Zika one probably worked pretty well, but as I said, Zika sort of disappeared before we could test it. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are set up as two vaccines, a uh, prime and a boost. So for Pfizer, it's three weeks apart. For Moderna, it's four weeks apart. The idea of the boost is to kind of really lock in that immunity. Um, now, could it be five weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks for some of these? Maybe, we're beginning to learn there's probably some flexibility here. So uh, could you even just forego the second shot? Maybe, and I'll show you why. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a one-shot deal. Uh, that's a huge advantage for underserved countries among some other, other factors with that vaccine. So this is just the data from the two trials for Pfizer and Moderna, big trials, very well done. Uh, and they, they were highly, highly effective. That was a real surprise. We were kind of expecting 60, 65, 70%. That would have been perfectly good. We would have been jumping for joy. But these two really showed huge efficacy. Now, th these trials were done before the emergence of variants. That's where the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has an advantage because that trials was done, those trials were done in countries with a high prevalence of more resistant virus, South Africa, Chile, Mexico. Uh, and so uh, that's probably why the efficacy of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a little lower, 77%, 67% in some places, but that's good enough. So it's more important that you get the first vaccine that's available to you and not try to wait for an mRNA vaccine. There's nothing better about them uh, they're all about the same in terms of their effectiveness. They're all highly effective. Uh, this is the data for the Pfizer trial. These are the people that were getting the placebo, not the real deal. These are the people that got vaccinated. Placebo people had all the cases of COVID. These guys had, did have five cases of COVID. You can still get COVID with the vaccine because about 5% of people still did, but very, very dramatic difference between the placebo and the vaccinated group. And this is the data. This is sort of my little representation. Here's the real stuff for the Pfizer trial to show the antibody response. Very, very good antibody response, probably better than natural infection. Uh, after, here's your first vaccine, about eight days later, you've got some pretty good antibody circulating, maybe 40 to 60%. Uh, by the time you're out ready to get your second vaccine, which in the Pfizer is, th is three weeks and in Moderna it's four weeks, you've got close to 70, 80% of your neutrophil, uh, neutrophilic, excuse me, neutralizing antibodies. So that's really pretty good. You get that second vaccine, you get an extra little oomph there and uh, that is better than natural infection. That's why we tell people that if they've had COVID, they still should get uh, vaccinated. Similar response with the cellular immune system. This is the part of the immune system that remembers things. Uh, and so this is perhaps one of the most important parts for the longevity of immunity. Uh, very, very good results with, um, with both of these vaccines and Johnson & Johnson, very similar. Side effects, for the most part, the side effects are more pronounced after the second shot. Those of you who've already been vaccinated might remember the second shot was a little rougher uh, kind of have a sore arm, can have a fever, sometimes high, 102, that can happen. Flu-like symptoms, muscle pain, headache, joint pain, swollen lymph nodes, a fairly common thing now. Uh, and sometimes it kind of takes you out for a couple of days. We often uh, tell our healthcare workers to save those two days after their second dose because you might go down with it. I wasn't that sick. I don't know if Dr. Devolio was, uh, was very sick after her second shot, but I had kind of, I felt kind of yuck after the second one. The first one, I just had a sore arm. Uh, but I've, several of my associates got kind of sick with it and couldn't work, so. The severe allergic responses or anaphylaxis are not very common. Um, they really continue to be very, very rare in spite of the high numbers of people now that have been vaccinated. We're still only seeing a few cases, you know, 10, 13 cases, 14 cases. Nobody, thankfully, as of this point, has died from anaphylaxis. Um, it seems to be quite rare, but it is something, if you have a history of anaphylaxis, either to food or to medications, excuse me, 
then you might want to discuss that with your doctor uh, before you get vaccinated, but we still probably want you vaccinated. This is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, adenovirus vector vaccine. So the genetic information for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is put inside another kind of virus, an adenovirus, which is harmless. That then is taken up by the cell and then that information uh, goes into uh, the uh, place here and makes you stimulates the production of antibodies to the um, spike protein, similarly to the, as the mRNA ones. Uh, this is also a large trial, 43,000 people. Uh, again, you see lower efficacy rates, not because it's a less effective vaccine, but because this, these studies were done in very uh, high mutated populations. And so they're probably a little bit more representative of what's going on out in the environment right now. Perhaps the most important part of Johnson & Johnson, it was 100% effective in preventing death. Uh, as are the other two vaccines. They're quite, quite, that's really one of the most important things. And ultimately that's what you wanna do. It's, you don't wanna be sick. You don't wanna have to go to the hospital, but you really don't want people to die. Um, uh, so it, again, this, these were very well studied. It had a little bit more diverse ethnic group. Uh, it also doesn't have the deep cold storage requirements of the other two vaccines. So this will be the vaccine and these types of vaccines are the ones that will be predominantly used in developing countries uh, down the road. Women uh, who are pregnant, we still don't know. Pfizer is currently doing a study in about 2,000 women. Uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that the vaccines not be withheld from women. We know that COVID-19 in pregnant women is very bad. Uh, you may have heard about many patients that have mothers who've died and their babies are now without a mom. Uh, so uh, in the grand scheme of things, the risks of this these vaccines are far outweigh, the benefits of the vaccines far outweigh the risk. We don't think the risks are very much, um, but we don't know because the studies are just now beginning to uh, happen. Immunocompromised people, people with HIV, people with cancer, people on um, steroids or medications that are you know, for inflammatory bowel disease, um, psoriasis, those sort of things, uh, they should still get vaccinated. Um, they may not have as robust a response, but they probably have as good, a good enough response. And they, of course, are at very high risk for developing complications from COVID. Uh, children, that study is also being done. They've dropped the rate now to down to about eight years old uh, for the mRNA vaccines. They look very good. I think that probably they are very safe in children. Little kids, the sort of five-year-old types and below, don't seem to get the disease very much. Uh, they can transmit it. There are, of course, these children now that have this multi-system inflammatory disease, very bad disease, but that's quite rare, thankfully. Neurologic disorders, you know, we always get a little skittish about giving vaccines in patients with Guillain-Barre or MS or ALS, but the truth is they don't do very well with this disease. So again, the benefits of a vaccine, I think far outweigh the potential risk. There have not been any um, uh, of these type of neurologic problems. The AstraZeneca vaccine had two, some sort of neurologic events in two people in their very large trial, uh, but they were looked at and decided that they were not related to the vaccine. In anaphylaxis history, we talked about. Again, I wanna just to address the fact that we have to vaccinate everybody. We won't get this pandemic under control unless everybody gets vaccinated. Even as we roll out the vaccines, we can already see that people that live in disadvantaged areas uh, do not have access to the vaccine as easily as those of us in affluent areas. Uh, and this was a little quote from one of my students that I just taught a course on SARS-CoV-2 at Occidental in the fall. And uh, this is one of my pre-med students who wrote a little article in the Occidental, but she had a very interesting statistic that in South Pasadena, um, that uh, uh, South Pasadena had a case rate of COVID of one in 21, uh, but they had a vaccination rate of one in six. So you can see affluent uh, areas have higher access to vaccine, not because they're jumping the line, it's just they know how they have computers, they have smartphones, they know how to navigate the computers. Uh, and they can get access to a vaccine. So there really is a push both by our hospital at Huntington uh, and the Pasadena Public Health Department to address the high risk uh, populations who may not have access to information uh, in our community, but also around LA County and throughout California and the country. Lots of folks, uh, older people who might be at home, don't have any transportation. Uh, again, they don't know how to get the vaccine. And it has been challenging. It is, that part of things has been a lot of hiccups here and there. Well, what does it mean if you're once you're vaccinated for SARS-CoV-2? That means that your immune system will recognize the virus as a pathogen. You will develop neutralizing antibodies and activate your cellular immune system that will confer, most likely confer immunity to, your, to the disease. You will be significantly less likely to develop severe disease and require hospitalization. 
you will be significantly less likely to die from COVID-19. Uh, and you may be less likely to spread SARS-CoV-2. And that, that is beginning to emerge this last two weeks that probably that is the case. That drove a little bit of why the CDC changed some of their recommendations yesterday um, about getting together with people. Um, it is not a, a get out of jail card here. You can't take rip your mask off and go roll in COVID. Uh, this is a very tricky time right now. Many of the population, most of the population still isn't vaccinated and the emergence of variants is going to be uh, something we have to keep an eye on. We do have beginning to have scientific data that the vaccines do affect the pandemic. They drive down the uh, density of the virus. Uh, we've seen that uh, certainly in Israel, they have a large, um, almost the entire Israeli population is now vaccinated except for the ultra Orthodox members of their society, but uh, they've had a huge reduction in their uh, pandemic numbers. And we can see it even here in Pasadena, you know, the nursing homes were hit very hard early on with the pandemic. Uh, we have had not any cases in many of the nursing homes for the last uh, th four weeks, which is remarkable because most of their uh, clients have been vaccinated. We don't know how long these things are going to last. We think they'll last at least a year, maybe longer. It's possible they could be lifelong, but they are specific for this particular virus. So uh, that's going to be an important consideration if we have to watch for the emergence of another zoonotic spillover event. This is why I'm still nervous. Whenever the virus replicates, it has the potential for mutating. It's a very uh, disorganized and inaccurate replicator. So it makes a lot of mistakes. And every once in a while, those mistakes confer selective advantage to that type of virus. And so it's no surprise that we are seeing the emergence of these variants. Uh, the United Kingdom B117 variant uh, is probably going to become the dominant variant in the United States. It's very infectious. It produces higher viral loads, higher amounts of virus that increases the infectivity of the person who has the disease or is an asymptomatic carrier of the disease. And it may impact the virulence or nastiness of uh, the sickness that you get. And I will say, looking at what we experienced in December and January at the hospital, those patients were younger, sicker, died faster, and uh, often didn't have some of the comorbidities we've traditionally associated with COVID-19. So I do think that these variants are there and I think we were experiencing some of that. That was why the ferocity of that surge was perhaps so bad, built on all the holidays where everybody passed everything back and forth. The South Africa variant, the B1351 is very prevalent. This is the one I'm perhaps the most worried about. Um, there's a terrible pandemic in Northern Brazil going on right now in the, in the city of Manaus where many of those people, about 60% of the population have already had COVID, but now they're getting it again. And it's because of the presence of this variant. This variant may be the most likely to escape or largely escape the efficacy of our vaccine. So we're gonna have to watch this very, very carefully. California has got a couple of its own homegrown variants. Uh, and uh, that's also scary. All of these variants impact the way the virus attaches to the receptor site uh, by making it attach more easily. So they're more infectious. And that's why you have to still wear your mask when you're out and about in town, especially when you're around people that either haven't been immunized or are at high risk for developing serious complications from COVID. This is just some data showing the emergence of the California variants uh, that were actually um, uh, discovered uh, or uh, at uh, Caltech uh, and at Cedars, they actually um, have been keeping track. We're doing a little bit better job now of keeping track of genomic sequencing. We didn't do such a good job in the first part of the year. New York City's got their own uh, culprit here that looking looking kind of bad too. Uh, and again, they may these produce higher viral loads, uh, more disease, and they're much more infectious. Uh, the vaccines right now seem to be pretty effective against most of them. Uh, much, you know, it's less, it's maybe 50, 60%, but they do seem to work pretty well. Uh, but it is possible that one of these little guys could transform into something that's completely immune to the vaccines and we'd have to start all over again, which for all of us, I think would be probably the most devastating blow after all this hard work. Um, Fauci said this uh, early in February and it's absolutely right. This is why we have to get as many people vaccinated, not just in the United States, but around the world as fast as possible to try to outbox and outrun uh, these viruses because otherwise we'll be right back where we started from. We've got to get to this magic magic place, herd immunity. Dr. Dolio mentioned we spent a lot of time in Tanzania. Uh, here's a nice herd. These are the Pfizer vaccine recipients. Here's the uh, Moderna vaccine recipients. 
Um, but the bottom line is we have to get enough people who've either had the infection naturally or who have been vaccinated. So if you, uh, that can basically create an environment where the virus has nowhere to go. And for an infectious virus like this, it's gonna have to be about 70, 80% of the population. Other viruses, you can have lower numbers for herd immunity, but we're gonna to have to get that high number. Herd immunity also changes. If people start falling off and not getting vaccinated, we can go down and then go back up again. So it is kind of a fluid um, statistic, but it's a very, very important one. Again, this is not a national pandemic. Uh, this is a global pandemic and it is all over the world. There isn't one continent that it hasn't affected, including Antarctica, one of the research stations down there had a COVID outbreak. So we've got to try to be equitable about getting the vaccines out. It doesn't do us any good if we don't have any COVID in the United States and they have some in Tanzania where I go. Uh, so we've got to encourage countries that are re reticent to vaccinate or recognize the pandemic to step up and uh, be available for vaccines. COVAX is the international organization from WHO that will try to create uh, basically distribution of vaccine to underserved countries uh, and get everybody vaccinated. It's going to be a Herculean effort to do this around the world, but we're doing it, we're starting it, and uh, we've all got to pitch in. This could be the great unifier of the world because the virus, again, doesn't care whether you're a Russian or Chinese or American or Maasai, it just wants to go to a new host. This is our opportunity to come together uh, as a planet and, and get ourselves uh, in better shape. Uh, why do you still have to wear a mask and practice social distancing? Because not everybody responds to the vaccine in the same way. Some people get a vaccine and don't respond at all. We see that with influenza. You can still maybe carry the virus to a non-immune host. Um, most people at this point haven't been vaccinated, but that number is increasing pretty quickly every day in the United States. The variants may dictate uh, the situation very much, and we still don't know very much about this virus. Uh, so that's those are sort of the things why we want to kind of really move forward with caution. And again, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, we want to honor those people who've lost family members or those who've lost their lives themselves to recognize that this is a terrible, terrible event that happened that we have to do better next time uh, and recognize that pandemics are a part of our history uh, and we should be prepared and uh, be ready for uh, anything that comes down the pipe because it will happen again. If we can land a car on Mars, uh, then we can get this pandemic under control and be better stewards of the planet that we live on because I have to say, looking at the pictures that are coming back from Percy, Perseverance, uh, Mars still doesn't look too habitable to me. So. This is the only deal in town here for right now, and we've got to take care of our planet so that we don't uh, end up uh, in a worse situation. And with that, I will thank you and take your questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner. This was just so informative um, and hopeful and just really appreciated the focus on making access to the vaccine equitable. So thank you so much. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat, so I'm gonna go ahead and moderate those um, and also invite people to unmute themselves um, if they have a question they would like to say. Um, but first and foremost, um, someone asked, I have had both vaccines and I'm now volunteering at Huntington Hospital. What precautions should I take to protect my family? So first of all, thank you very much for being one of our great volunteers. We have an amazing group of volunteers and, and uh, kudos to you for getting back into the soup over there. Um, so I'm glad you're vaccinated. That's a good thing that does protect you. While you were there, you must wear a mask. We of course have a mandatory mask, uh, mask rule. Uh, and um, when you go home, I think it's good that you uh, wash your hands very carefully. You might wanna take the clothes that you wore, off, that you wore at the hospital and, and wash them quickly, wear things that are simple to wash. Um, you know, we don't quite know whether vaccinated people can carry the virus. Uh, the hospital obviously is ground zero for COVID. It's, a, it's sort of the, it's very likely that you're exposed to virus even when you're out in the foyer. So it's important that you be cognizant of that when you go home. Um, I wear scrubs when I'm there and I come home and I take them off and I put them in the washing machine and I take a shower and I don't walk in with the shoes that I've had on there. So um, it, it's important that you be kind of hyper vigilant about that. Do you have to be that like that in the next few months? I don't know. As more and more people get vaccinated, it'll be less problematic. Remember that uh, uh, most of our staff have been vaccinated, the patients not necessarily. Uh, and also we now are having visitors in the hospital who also could be bringing disease in. So you just need to be pay, pay attention, wash your hands a lot, don't touch your eyes and your nose, wear the mask uh, and be very careful when you go home. 
Great. And what is the general advice on giving the vaccine to cancer patients on targeted therapies? Um, can a patient get a vaccine while on dexamethasone for brain edema? Um, should I wait until the dexamethasone is complete? You know, that's such a good question and we really don't have a lot of data on, uh, on that yet. Um, again, these vaccines appear to be very safe. Uh, the biggest concern about giving the vaccines, uh, well, there's twofold. One is that they do have some significant side effects, usually on the second vaccine, that can sometimes be confused for uh, either a complication of the underlying disease or the treatment. So for example, last week we had two patients, one that had just had a heart attack and had a coronary angiogram and stents put in, and another patient that had, a, had just had a stroke, and they were due for their second uh, Pfizer vaccine. And uh, they asked me whether they should get that. And I, I said, I think we should pause until we get a little farther away from their acute event, because if they develop a fever, which many people do after they have the vaccine or they have a headache or they have um, a little bit of chills, then it's kind of hard to tease that out from what's going on with the disease. So if you have the luxury of being in between chemotherapy uh, or where you can, you can um, have a period where you don't have too many immunosuppressants on board, that might be the ideal time. On the other hand, you may be people that you can't do that, so then just get vaccinated. The, the bigger concern is that you may not respond very well to the vaccine with those kind of medications on board. Um, and so that's why you still need to be very vigilant. If you're uh, getting kind of that kind of chemotherapy, even when you've been vaccinated, you have to be super duper careful. So those people, I would still consider high risk uh, and you have to be very careful when you're mingling with people who've been vaccinated and you don't have your masks on. That's the situation that I worry about a lot with some of this opening up that the CDC kind of proposed yesterday. Thank you. Um, and when you are exercising outdoors and there is no one around, is it safe to keep your mask pulled down until you see someone approaching from a distance? You can, there's always that person who, I, I just I was walking my dog a few weeks ago and I had my mask down actually because I get my glasses fog up and I can't see anything and a guy came running past me no mask on and he I didn't see him because he was right behind me he was kind of a stealth runner and and so I that was I mean it was an instantaneous encounter and I don't I obviously didn't get COVID and I wasn't worried about that much but be a little careful but yes you can I mean it's it's if nobody's around and you've got to you, you know you're pretty uh, careful, then just uh, you can go ahead and wear it below, below, below your nose as long as you're ready to put it back up again when you have to. Great. Um, and some love in the chat too. I've been listening to you on KPCC. Thank you for your clear information and insightful suggestions. My son, who is 13, is scheduled to return to middle school on April 8th. When will vaccines be available for young teens? With the teachers and staff having had vaccines and all are wearing masks, what do you think the risk of transmission at middle school might be? Uh, that's a hard one to assess. Uh, that age group uh, in middle school, they are, they, they can get the disease. They don't get it too badly, but they can certainly be transmitters of the disease. It, you know, they're sort of the, we know that about 12 to 25 maybe even a little bit older, those are folks that, that often are asymptomatic and can be very, very big spreaders of disease. Um, so there is some risk. The fact that teachers are vaccinated is helpful. That certainly protects the teachers. And I think that was the right thing to do. I think by the summer, it's likely we'll have, first of all, we'll have some data on pediatric uh, use, the use of vaccines in the pediatric population. And I, I think I, pr I would predict that they're going to be safe and that they will be um, available for children. So within a few short weeks, months maybe, um, really anybody uh, over the age of six probably will have access to a vaccine. Um, you know, I think that in the interim, you know, teaching your kid to wear the mask and be respectful and that kind of stuff and make sure they kind of clean up before they come into the house. It's, it's a lot of common sense. And, you know, the, the, the good thing is from having done this for a whole year is we sort of know how to do this. So just just really keep the masking and the vigilance up. Don't get too laissez-faire about stuff. Great. Um, if someone had some lymph nodes removed, um, how would that affect um, swollen lymph nodes from the vaccine? Um, and then a follow-up to that is how can people that have had cancer but are under 65 get vaccinated? Uh, well, that group I think is coming up because you're immunocompromised. And I think in the next week, uh, that's the next sort of tier uh, and so um, uh, under 65 with a, with a chronic condition. 
they will be available for vaccination. Uh, the absence of a lymph node doesn't make any difference. The lymphadenopathy thing is not real common. I, I've seen it, a couple of my friends have actually had it, um, but um, it's not very common. So I wouldn't worry about it. And you've got plenty of other lymph nodes that can do the work for the, the ones that are missing. So um, that shouldn't be an issue. Great, and then someone um, was hospitalized for anaphylaxis. Um, not sure the reason why. Um, usually have to take ibuprofen, acetaminophen before vaccines. One of my doctors says I should take ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and one of my doctors says I shouldn't. Which would you recommend? It depends on which which one which doctor was which. You know, the infectious disease doctor or the or the primary care doctor. Uh, so. The, the sort of general recommendation is not to, to take anti-inflammatories if you can avoid them before the vaccine, because it may attenuate your response a little bit. There's a little bit of scientific data to support that. But the bottom line is, I think that it's probably perfectly fine. And I wouldn't go into a panic. I'll, I'll, several of you might be thinking, oh, I think I took a Tylenol before I went down to have my shot. Uh, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Um, that Those drugs might be helpful for anaphylaxis. Those are not really the drugs we use for anaphylaxis. Um, uh, Benadryl and hydroxyzine and those sort of things are the more likely ones to use. Um, but uh, I don't think I would, you know, if you can avoid taking them, that's fine. You can take them afterwards. That's if you have a sore arm and a fever, you can take Tylenol. I would maybe avoid the, the non-steroidals, the ibuprofen, but I, they don't really interfere that much with the vaccine. But if you can avoid taking them at the beforehand, that would be a good idea. If you do have a history of anaphylaxis, you need to let the vaccinators know that. Uh, at the vaccine site because they will monitor you for 45 minutes after you get your shot. Okay, and I know we're coming up towards the hour. Do you have time for just a few more questions? Thank sure. you so much. Um, so another person asked, of the available vaccines, are there any that are better or worse for immunocompromised individuals? None of the vaccines are better than worse, worse than in the other one. Um, and I, I worry about this a little bit with the Johnson & Johnson thing because of the numbers that that's sort of freaking everybody out. I'm going to wait for the mRNA vaccine and that's a better vaccine. There's no evidence that those are better vaccines. They all do the same thing. Uh, they all are safe. Um, the advantage of the Johnson & Johnson is it's one shot. And you can make an argument that, well, if you have anaphylaxis, that maybe that's a good one to get because you only have sort of one shot at the anaphylaxis problem instead of getting it the second time. Now, I will warn everybody that if we end up having lots of variants, there could be a third vaccine in our future, a, a third shot, because uh, in fact, uh, both Moderna and Pfizer, and I believe Johnson & Johnson are beginning to tool up uh, a different set of vaccines if they have to, that might be needed if the variants become more prominent. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns about, uh, about how these vaccines behave in different populations. Uh, but one isn't better than the other. Whatever vaccine you have access to as quickly as possible is the one you should get. And um, uh, there's really no reason uh, to pick one over the other. Great. There were some questions that came into me about prevention um, of another global pandemic. And someone said, please talk to us about how HIV and Ebola and the coronavirus all started in animals and the importance of protecting our natural environments. So that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. That, that could be an hour's worth of, <laughs> of talking about things. Um, so this is a very common thing. Um, uh, HIV came from chimpanzees. Uh, Ebola comes from bats. Uh, this virus came from bats. Bats are a fascinating mammal. They fly. They're the only flying mammal. And they have a very peculiar immune system because, uh, because they fly, that's a very stressful thing to do. And so they're not able to, so their, their immune system is very tamped down. And so they um, are very prone to harboring lots of viruses. The other thing about bats is that they are colon they're colonizers. They sit in, they, they get together in large groups with one another. And the echolocation feature that bats have, they're actually coughing. So they're kind of the perfect little animal to be a host of viruses. And when viruses jump from one species to another, they often um, become more virulent. They often become worse. And we've certainly seen that bats are a very important vector for virus, viral infections, especially Ebola. But there's some other viruses, uh, Hindra virus and Nipah virus that are pretty nasty things as well. Um, and, and certainly this is the biggest zoonotic one we've had in a long time. HIV uh, came from chimpanzees. Uh, the virus mutated when it infected humans. 
uh, in a much more aggressive way. And so this is a lesson that when you destroy the environment, when you cause climate change and it takes away normal foliage or feeding grounds for animals and they migrate into urban areas, uh, when you uh, keep animals in small cages in markets and which is very stressful for them, uh, they get sick uh, and their viral counts can go up. Um, uh, when you go into areas that were previously unknown and are, were protected areas, all of those things damage to the ecosystems, um, increase the risk that you're going to have a spillover event. And there's of course a great book by David Quantum that's called that spillover. And he talks a lot about some of the important zoonotic infections that was before this one came along. And so it's very, very important that we take, pay attention to this. This is because of our behavior uh, of trapping animals, selling them in markets under very stressful situations, exposing ourselves to animals that we don't normally have exposure to, destroying their environment. Uh, and, and it works both ways. Animals, of course, get a lot of infections that we have. Some of the, the chimpanzees and mountain gorillas uh, get uh, measles uh, from humans and it kills them. So it goes both ways. It's important that we be respectful tenants on this little planet that we have, because if we continue to do this, we're going to destroy ourselves and, uh, and many, many species. And so um, uh, my great mentor and good friend, and uh, also a good friend of Dr. Devolio's, Jane Goodall, uh, her words right now about protecting the environment and being stewards for the earth are so, so important um, that we have to protect the natural environment to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. It will happen again, uh, but we need to be vigilant. We need to maintain strong international organizations that identify emerging pandemics quickly so we can get them under control. This, we had an opportunity in China to get this under control. We certainly had an opportunity in our own country to get this under control and we missed those opportunities. And that's why we have the situation we do now. Well, that's so important and wonderful to hear because I think there's some empowerment there to do something in, in what might otherwise seem an out of control situation. So thank you for that. Um, we may not have time for all questions, but I'll just field a couple of more, if that's okay. Um, is cancer in remission considered a high risk factor? Uh, you know, I think that if you're a little bit in a little bit riskier situation, you're a little more compromised from an immune standpoint uh, than someone who doesn't have cancer in remission. Uh, but the remission part is great. That means that, you know, your, your all systems are operational. So get the vaccine. It's a good time for you to do it. Uh, and, um, you know, you don't want to get COVID that I have to say, you know, we haven't had too many cancer patients, uh, partly because I think cancer patients are very protected. City of Hope has just been absolutely paranoid about their population. And that's good. That's good to be scared of this because it's a scary virus. It, it does seem to much like HIV sort of had certain types of infections that it produced. This virus has certain risk factors. Uh, renal failure is a big one. Diabetes is a big one. Obesity is a really big one um, in terms of uh, having a bad outcome. So, uh, but cancer certainly impairs your immune system, but if it's in remission, you should be in pretty good stead and that's when you should get vaccinated. And then finally, what are the main reasons people are refusing to get the vaccine? I think it's many reasons. Um, and I think it's important when you have that conversation with people that you don't try to convince them to get the vaccine. You just try to find out what their concerns are about getting the vaccine. Some people have religious reasons. They don't want to get the vaccine. Uh, some people have historic reasons. I think uh, our, tra our track record with uh, the African-American population and uh, you know, certainly then the heels of Tuskegee and some of these other dreadful things that happened in our past have left us at, uh, in a situation where they're understandably very uh, concerned about federally funded programs and medical care. Um, some people, you know, want to do sort of organic things or more homeopathic things. And I think, you know, my job is not to make people get a vaccine. It's just to encourage them that this is a very, very bad disease. And I often say when, we're, when I'm in the ICU taking care of these patients and I talk to the nurses, I said, boy, all it's going to take is one tour of the intensive care unit. And I think that people that were hesitant may go get their vaccine because right now it's the only way to protect you and your family and to get back to a normal life. And if we don't get enough people vaccinated, we're going to be dealing with this for a long, long time. I am encouraged, but I think 
people seem pretty enthusiastic. I really thought there was going to be a lot of problems with this, but I do think there are even some people that may get the vaccine on the sly. I don't care. Just go get it. You don't have to tell anybody if you want to say you're, you know, you don't want to wear a mask or you don't, you don't really believe in vaccines, but you want to get this vaccine, just, you know, do it and don't tell anybody. But I think it is important that you understand why people are hesitant and have a conversation and, and try to explain, well, these are the reasons why I think it would be good for you and it won't hurt you and it will help you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner. This has been so informative and candid and like I said, hopeful and empowering. And I feel that we all can do our due diligence and pass along some of this information to our loved ones so that we have a positive ripple effect and, and can do something just as you've shared. So we thank you so much for making the time. We know how busy you are. Uh, we so appreciate it. And thank you everybody for attending tonight. It's my pleasure. I'm sorry, can I have, I just wanted to ask one quick question. Um, is that okay? Of course, sure. Okay. Um, I have gotten both my vaccines, thank God. Um, I didn't have much problem with the second one though I did get a few of the side effects. Um, I am take immunotherapy every three weeks. Um, and so I am immunocompromised. So I just wanted to encourage whoever was asking and I am in remission as well. So I'm not sure who was asking, but it, I got mine and I feel great. Um, my, my question actually was my friend in Arkansas who I haven't seen in years has invited me there in June, which I'm scared to death to go. But now since things are looking up, what are your thoughts about actually traveling if both of us have had our vaccines? So the traveling thing is still a little dicey. Um, right. When you travel, there's lots of exposure to COVID um, and people who aren't vaccinated. Uh, and you're introducing yourself into populations that you've never been around before. So, um, uh, you know, can people do it safely? It does take some effort. You obviously have to wear a very, very effective mask. You know, you might see if you can get an N95 mask as opposed to a. Oh, I've got. I, I usually double mask. I'm a KN95 and another mask and a face shield. That's okay. that's how I rolled since last March. So, okay. um, so uh, you know, but the actual traveling thing, it you know, it does put you at risk. And right. you know, one thing I might suggest for you as an individual is you might want to have your physician uh, draw an antibody test and just make sure that you've got some antibodies because uh, when you're a cancer survivor or when you're getting chemotherapy or when you're in remission, you may not have a, a really robust response. And, I, and, and although that's kind of a, a sort of gross way of, not a gross way, an icky, just gross in terms of kind of an uh, inaccurate way, of um, measuring things, it might be helpful just to say, oh yeah, no, I do have antibodies, so I, I did seem to respond to the vaccine. You're gonna have to be super duper careful. Arkansas yeah. has a boatload of disease. I mean, frankly, every state does, um, but they also have, they're, they're um, you know, kind of have had some issues with masking and stuff. And so you may well be exposed to people in a pretty unprotected way when you're there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, she's a transplant from here. She's just like me. Okay. So she's not, she's, do, she's not from Arkansas and well, they I, live in a big not, gated community. It's not a, it's not a criticism of Arkansas. Ar no, no, no. I know. But I just, it's, for it's, like of her just, way of thinking is the right. same as mine. But you're going to have, it, you're going to have interactions just in the airports. And that's, right. that's the, that's the kicker. That's why Dr. Walensky, who by the way is an excellent uh, person to have in the CDC, uh, is so adamant about people not traveling right now. It's absolutely necessary. I do think by, you know, maybe by June, but certainly by July, August, September, I think we are going to be in a better spot if we can just kind of hang in there for that time. Uh, I agree. And, you know, it's just, it, everybody deserves it because everybody has done, has, you know, <laughs> really done their best to try to get through this thing. Most people anyway. I but, was just going to say that. Most yes. people. Yeah. But we got to get, we got to bring everybody along here. So we just, uh, want to be careful and, and dip our toe into the world of normality very slowly. Yeah. And then, I'm sorry, last question. Um, um, as far as my immunotherapy is concerned, I heard from my, my doctor who actually gave me the COVID vaccines that instead of the, cause I got Moderna, 
instead of the 95% efficacy, it's now it's down in the 80s because I'm on aminotherapy. Is that correct? Uh, that's not known, but that was probably a, a, an educated guess. And I think that's okay. Good, but that's good enough. I, I, yeah, I mean, I would take that over getting COVID or not getting the vaccine any day. So thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. it. I will remind everybody, those of you who listened to Larry Mantle yesterday, a, a caller can't called in who was in the Pfizer trial and she got COVID. Remember that, that 5% of people do get the disease. Now she didn't have to be hospitalized and she didn't die and she was you know, kind of punk, but not super sick. So uh, it, is, it does happen. So I, and, it, and wait till it starts happening and with more people getting vaccinated, then there'll be great angst among the media about, oh, the vaccines aren't working and their next, you know, they won't have the Megan and Harry thing to rely on as a distraction for a while. So. And then a lot of things, <laughs> nobody's really talking about these kids that are actually getting it. My niece who was 12 got COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Well, thank you again so much for your time, Dr. Schreiner, and all of your generosity in answering all these questions. Um, I will bid you all adieu. Thank you so much for attending tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.